challenge in the face and wink. First Lady of this city has faced and looked into the face of many challenges, probably none more pronounced than the issue of mental illness in this city. There are so many in our city who suffer from what some have called the violence of silence, who suffer silently, struggling, wrestling, battling with mental illness. The tragedy is that in this country, in this city, we often overlook those who suffer in this silence. For my fellow clergy here, the Schaefer Institute did a study that said that almost 70% of Protestant pastors suffer from depression. Really? But only 22% even talk about it from the pulpit. Which means that we have to do the work to destigmatize mental illness. We have to follow the lead of the First Lady of this city who has done that by speaking about the harsh realities of those who suffer in silence. And not only following the lead of the mayor, but carving a path for wholeness and wellness for so many in our city. So brothers and sisters, if you would, join me in welcoming the First Lady of New York City, Shirley McCray. Weekend of 
Faith for Mental Health, which many of you participated in, and we were able to reach a quarter of a million New Yorkers during this weekend. So I want you all, please give yourselves a hand because what happened during that weekend is still resonating throughout our city. Please applaud yourselves. We could not have achieved um, what we're doing to end the stigma without all of you participating. So I thank you all again for that. And for Thrive NYC to reach its full potential, we're going to need more people like you. We're going to need more from people like you to get people to appropriate care and to truly end the stigma and to save lives when people are in crisis. So we can help end this shame that too many people live with by uh, talking with our communities about mental health, by sharing our own stories. There's nothing more powerful and sharing our own stories to help people become comfortable about talking about their own stories. And we also have a toolkit that you can download at nyc.gov slash faith toolkit for more information. So please make use of this. I'm going to repeat it one more time. nyc.gov slash faith toolkit. That will give you more information and the tools you need to actually spread the word and help your own communities. And please, let your communities know about our free mental health first aid course. We are giving a quarter of a million New Yorkers the tools they need to recognize the signs and the symptoms of mental illness and substance misuse disorders and help people respond in a crisis and connect people to appropriate care. This class is free. If you haven't done so already, you can sign up for a class by visiting nyc.gov slash thrive nyc and clicking on mhfa and that's mental health first aid i also ask you to host a mental health first aid class at your house of worship and we can give you the, the tools to do that so many people feel much more comfortable um, <laughs> taking this course within their own neighborhood uh, people they're surrounded by, people that they know and trust, and we like to get this course in as many different kinds of communities as possible. That's what all I have to share with you at this moment. I've asked you to do a lot, but I know you are capable <laughs> and willing, and you've done so much already. I thank you for that, and I, I look forward to working with you going forward to do even more. And now I want to introduce a man who's fighting every day so that all New Yorkers can thrive, and that is my husband, Mayor Bill de Blasio. So despite some of the challenges that we face, I want to wish everyone a happy New Year, because we will make it a happy New Year together. And this gathering makes me hopeful. It makes me profoundly hopeful. Because what we do here in New York City effortlessly other people around this country, other people around this world struggle to do and still have not found out how in too many cases. Look around you. All the great faith traditions of the world represented in one room. 
I don't see fistfights breaking out. I don't see people separating themselves, glaring across the table. I see harmony. I see embrace. I see inclusion. And take a moment to think of the magnitude of that. We're here, right in the center. One of the greatest cities the world has ever known. One of the highest expressions of human capacity and civilization. Arguably the most diverse city, not only on the planet today, but in the entire history of humanity. No, don't go that far. And are we perfect? No. Do we have perfect harmony? No. But have we found something of a balance point? Have we found a way to live and let live? Do we think it's good and right to gather together? Yes. And I, I, I doubt that anyone coming to the room said, I'm about to participate and be an actor in something exceptional in human history. I don't think that's what we assume when we come into a room like this, but if we showed this picture in many places in the world, even in many places in our own nation, it might shock people. But we, we think it's normal. We think it's just. We think it's right. We think it's every day in New York City. Let's think about what we've achieved. And then let's think about what it requires us to do in the times we're living in. I'll come back to that in just a couple of minutes because I want to encourage everyone in this moment to recognize just how much impact we can make in the times we're living in. Because our values are so strong and they're in such evidence right here, right now. Before I get to that, I want to talk about a couple other things, starting with the wonderful people that I am sharing this stage with. First, I want to just take a moment. Let us thank everyone who offered us their opening prayers and thoughts. We thank them so much. And I want to thank the man who has led our efforts to work ever more closely with communities of faith, and I think he's done an extraordinary job. Let's thank Pastor Mike Walwin for all he does. And all the members of our clergy council who daily, literally daily, help us to determine how to more justly and effectively govern this great city. Let's thank all of them as well. We are gathered with wonderful people from our administration. I want to call out their names because they work so hard every day. And just listen to all the names and then you can give them a warm applause. Our Community Affairs Commissioner Marco Cabellon, our Fire Commissioner Dan Nigro, our First Deputy Commissioner for the NYPD Ben Tucker, Small Businesses Commissioner Greg Bishop, Commissioner for Veteran Services Lori Sutton, Commissioner Doris Paul Ta Pauline Toole, our Director of Appointments Rachel Lauder, Chief of Staff to our First Lady Roxanne John, our Executive Director for Special events to put on these wonderful events. Carla Montero, our executive director for the Commission on Gender Equity, Ozzy Khalili, and the chair of the Business Integrity Commission, Daniel Brown, Brown, excuse me. And from the work we do specifically with faith communities, and there's been all of these folks have done extraordinary work. My senior advisor, Sarah Saeed, and our community liaisons, Jonathan Soto and Penny Ringel. Let's give them all a great joined by elected officials who are our partners in this work, our public advocate Tish James, our Bronx DA, Darcel Clark, and Assembly Members David Weprin and Brian Cavanaugh. Let's thank them. And we thank a man who served for quite a long time, uh, served the people of this city in our state government, our former governor, David Patterson. We thank you for joining us. Thank you.
And despite the eminence and, and importance and power and meaning of everyone in this room gathered on the stage and at the head tables and everywhere, no one will be insulted if I say the most important acknowledgement I make is the woman sitting to my right. And I have to say it because it's not just that she's the love of my life, and it's not that I'm entirely subjective on the subject of Shirley McRae. Yes, I am. But, but this part is objective. She had the audacity to believe that the biggest city in the country, the most complex city in the country, the busiest place anywhere on the earth, the most crowded media market, that somehow she, out of sheer spunk and vision, could get people to talk about something that our entire society had told us not to talk about. Now, you could call her audacious. You could say, wow, she is way out over the edge. But she did it. She said, we're going to have a conversation in the city about mental health. We're going to take away the stigma. We're going to get people the help they need. And it's actually starting to happen. Let us thank our first day. Now, let me talk about our common mission and why we gather. We, we don't just gather to feel good. It, it does feel good. It certainly feels good. It is affirmational. It is energizing to be in this room, to see so many people doing so much good together. You know, people who do good need to sometimes get nourishment by spending time with other people who do good. Pastor Waller made the point about why so many pastors face the challenge of depression. Not only is it part of our humanity that we have things like depression in us and we have to address them, but let's face it, the people at the front line, everyone in this room who are dealing with the human condition every hour of every day, who are agents of healing, who are literally absorbing the pain of so many others, well, of course that causes us our own torment. Each of you made a choice to be that human shield, to take in the pain of others selflessly. It's not easy. If you didn't feel anyway, you wouldn't be in these roles to begin with. So we gather for that nourishment, we gather for that mutual support, we gather to energize our faith in each other, we gather to epitomize the fact that this city stands squarely to the notion of every single faith must be respected. And that all faiths together add up to something powerful and beautiful. But we gather for purpose, too. We gather because we believe in this administration that you can't change the world, you can't reform, you can't heal if faith communities are not at the table. It's literally a contradiction. If you go forth with the notion of fundamentally changing the nature of things, it is impossible to reach a lofty goal by engaging those who are most trusted, those who speak most honestly, those who have the closest relationship to the people at the grassroots all over the city, and that is people in this room. We do this because we have an urgency. We have to make change. The status quo is not acceptable. A status quo riven with inequality and with too many people in pain and too many people struggling doesn't conform with any of our faiths. The beauty of the opening prayers and reflections is it points out the extraordinary commonality between faiths. All faiths seek justice. All faiths seek peace. And all faiths seek to end suffering. The words were a little different in each case, but they all added up the same. That is what we are all here to do. 
but we can't do it without you being at the front of all those efforts. I want to talk to you about one example that epitomizes this challenge. That our people and all of our communities are struggling. They're struggling to make ends meet. You know, it's wonderful to be in such a prosperous city. But at the same time, this prosperous city has come with a cost. It's harder and harder to live here because it's more and more expensive to live here. Mm-hmm. And our people are trying to make it against the odds. So many working people, so many middle class people, so many poor people. Those distinctions don't matter too much because everyone each month tries to make the pieces fit, tries to pay the bills, tries to choose between the rent and medicine and food. This is everyday occurrence. Even when people you'd think would be economically secure, they're still struggling because the costs are so high and the challenges are so great. Parents struggling to bring up their kids the right way. So many trying to help their elders. So many who have veterans in their families who haven't gotten the help they deserve. We're not necessarily, as a nation, the most family-friendly society. To put a lot of stress on families, we put a lot of obligations. Our schedules get busier and busier. People are working two and three jobs. We have to address that right here. And so when we look at those challenges, we say, what what is the responsibility of all of us? It is to lighten the burden with everything we do. And we have tried systematically working with you to look at each burden that our people face and one by one alleviate the suffering and lighten the load. We did it for parents with things like pre-K for all our four-year-olds and after school for all our middle school kids. For free, universal, for all. We did it for the million more people who now have paid sick leave, don't have to choose between their daily income and taking care of a loved one or themselves when they're sick. These are the kinds of things that change lives and lighten the burden. But the thing we need your help on right now in particular is the fact that the number one challenge, the number one expense, the number one stress that New Yorkers feel Watch my wire. Wait, wait, wait. is all about housing. And we need you to be part of the solution. Because right now, there are so many people we could help, but we don't reach enough of them, and they don't even know help is there for them. And no one is better suited to reach those in need than all of you gathered here today. We are very proud of the fact that in this administration for the last two years, for everyone in rent-stabilized housing, well over two million New Yorkers, there's been a rent freeze. But all those people need to know their rights and need to make sure that they're not cheated out of that rent freeze. That is a task that all of you can help us with profoundly. We know that we've changed the paradigm by offering people who are struggling and who are being treated unjustly, who aren't getting the repairs they need, aren't getting heat and hot water, are being overcharged rent, or worst of all, are being threatened with illegal eviction. Mm -hmm. We know we can help those people because today in New York City, anyone in those situations, we will give them a lawyer for free to defend their interests. But brothers and sisters, I've been saying this, and my colleagues in this administration have been saying this for the last year or two. All I have to do is call 311 
And if something illegal is going on, we will give you a lawyer for free. And wherever I go, to houses of worship, to community meetings, people are still amazed. Because they hadn't heard it before. Because there's too much information in New York City. There's too much noise. There's too much competing media. But there's one voice, and I don't say this to placate or flatter. I say it because I've studied it and I know it to be true. There's one voice that breaks through all of that. The voice that people trust, the voice of their faith leader. We need you to tell our people that we will not see them unjustly robbed of their own housing, the place their family <laughs> One last example that is so powerful, almost 80,000 people. Would be a, it would be enough people for a, a pretty big city in most parts of America. 80,000 people right now deserve a rent exemption, a rent increase exemption because they're either senior citizens or disabled. 80,000 people deserve it right this minute and are not signed up for it because they don't know they qualify. Literally, their rent will never go up. Give me the pink one. Give me the pink one. That's where you come in. We need you to be the great connectors, the messengers, the empowerers in a way that government alone can never do. Now, to pull these pieces together, I have to tell you this is one example, but there are so many others where if we as government were closer to the people through our partners, we could do so much more. I'll use the example of affordable housing because I think it's one of the very sharpest, but there are so many other great examples. We have to bind this together now with urgency. So, one thing I pride myself on is when I hear a good and noble idea, I steal it right away. <laughs> so, Pastor Walt, some months ago said, we can go much deeper if we could create a center to build a true bond between government and community. Mm -hmm. We could stop scratching the surface and go much deeper. So many community organizations want to be closer partners. So many faith organizations want to be closer partners. How do we bind this together so that government really reaches the grassroots in an unprecedented <coughs> way? How do we create a new paradigm? And he proposed a vehicle. And he was right. So I announce to you today the creation of something new. In City Hall, we will now have a center for faith and community partnerships. that affirmation, I just want to warn you, it's going to mean more work for all of us. And it's going to be good and no more work. Well, I could hear from the applause earlier in the program that you will like the fact that I announced the executive director of the new center will be Jonathan Soto.
creating the new world. Let me give you one extraordinarily powerful example. We know plenty, all of us in this room, about the years and years of this nation and in this city where the relationship between our police and our community wasn't right. The people worked, so many people in this room worked hard to overcome that. There were fits and starts, there were victories and setbacks. But now I see something more profound happening. And again, this is all of our work to do. It's a powerful and poignant week in New York City. Because we've been given over these years an incredible human example of what healing looks like. And he passed away this week and we will lay him to rest tomorrow. Detective Stephen McDonald. Mm -hmm. His story has to be told here and everywhere else. A young, earnest police officer shot and left for dead 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Who recovered not all of his body, but recovered his life. And then started to be a voice for healing and for reconciliation and for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. He spent 30 years forgiving the man who shot him and telling others that we have to forgive and we have to heal. Mm -hmm. Amazing example. And tomorrow we'll reflect on that, but then we have to get to work on building on that legacy. Because it's one thing to talk about forgiveness, but when you're that man in a wheelchair, paralyzed for 30 years, and you can talk about forgiveness, I think it tells us all. It's more than just words. He became one of the paramount examples and representatives and symbols of the NYPD. And today's NYPD is building on that idea more deeply than ever. Today's NYPD is training our officers to de-escalate conflicts. Mm -hmm. Today's NYPD is teaching implicit bias training help every one of our officers who are human beings, and every one of us in this room are human beings, and bias comes with the human package. But we don't have to fall victim to it if we see it and name it and weed it out. <laughs> and I want to give credit to the man who really has led this charge. I mentioned him earlier, but I wanted to stand up and be acknowledged because he has developed all of the training and retraining programs at NYPD. Our first Deputy Commissioner, Ben Tucker. Ben, where are you? Stand up. <laughs> but the last part of this I want to say is I have spent weeks and weeks reminding the city, reminding this nation Today's NYPD looks like New York City more than ever. We just graduated a class at Madison Square Garden, 63% city residents. Okay. A majority people of color, almost a quarter women. But the point I like to Focus on, given what's happened in our nation the last year or two, everywhere in the city, everywhere in this country, people have deep respect for the NYPD. It's the exemplar. So I say they have deep respect for the NYPD. Of course, you have deep respect for the 900 Muslim officers who are members of the NYPD. <laughs> and just in the last week, we have added to an even more inclusive NYPD by inviting and welcoming our sick brothers and sisters to join in numbers greater than ever before. And another thing our new center will do is give you another good task, which is to be noble recruiters.